So often when we read particular genres, we read them incorrectly. And that's one of the things we're, we're, we're talking about here. Mis mistaken genres, misunderstanding genres. Suppose you're walking through the grocery checkout line and you look and there's a Wall Street Journal there and it says, stock market set to rise. And you read that and you think, you know, maybe I should invest in some stocks. And right beside the Wall Street Journal is the National Enquirer. And it says, aliens invade New York. And at that point, you rush home and pack your car and head out into the desert. What have you just made? You just made a genre mistake, right? You recognize that the Wall Street Journal is news, is facts, is historical truth, whereas the National Choir is meant to be tabloid or entertainment. You have, you have missed that genre. So what we're doing is we're looking at various genres and saying, what are we looking for in this particular genre? So for our session this afternoon, we're going to talk about the gospel genre, how to read a genre. And I'm convinced that many of us, well, many in the church historically, particularly interestingly enough, the evangelical church have misread the, the gospel street. So we're going to talk about the gospel genre, and we'll focus especially on Mark's gospel with the time that we have. So what are the gospels? Here's our first question. What are the gospels? And that raises the question of genre or literary form, as we've talked about. Let's talk about the literary form of the, the, the gospels. I want to give you three terms to describe the literary form of the gospels. The first one is the gospels are historical. The gospels are historical. Now, what do I mean by that? You probably mean historically accurate. That's what you probably first thought of. And I certainly do mean that, but I mean some other things as well. In order to understand the Gospels, we have to recognize that they are historical. And they're historical in at least three different ways. Here's the first way. They have a history of composition. Sometimes we think the Gospels just fell out of the sky. Or that God just whispered into the ear of each Gospel writer what they should write. But we know with the whole Bible, that's not the way the Bible came came to be. The Bible came through a, a process, a historical process. These Gospel writers did research. Right? They interviewed the eyewitnesses. Some of them were eyewitnesses. And the question, such as which gospel came first, first, is actually an important question. I personally think Mark's gospel is written first, not because my name is Mark, but because I think the evidence points in that direction. And that helps us better understand what Matthew and Luke are doing, what Mark is doing, but also what Matthew and Luke is doing, are doing. So this is what we mean by a history of composition. The second way... The Gospels are historical in that they are set in a specific time and place. Now think about with that with me. What time and place? Well, first century Israel under the Greco-Roman Empire, the Greco-Roman authority. Now is that important to understand? Is it important to understand who the Pharisees were, who the Sadducees were? Absolutely. We cannot understand the Gospels. We cannot understand the message of Jesus without understanding this first century cultural context in which they occur. So recognize, this is all about context again, recognizing that the Gospels are set in a specific place and time is essential to understanding their nature. When Jesus comes on the scene and proclaims his fundamental message, the kingdom of God is at hand. That phrase has a whole history in Judaism. What would Jews be thinking in that context? What would that mean with reference to the Roman Empire? What would that mean with reference to past revolutionary movements within Israel, for example? So understanding the context, the historical, the political, the religious context of the Gospels is essential. So they are historical in that sense. But there's a third sense in which the Gospels are historical, and that is they present accurate historical material. Though as we'll see, they are theological, they are also meant to be historical. Now many people argue, many liberal scholars argue that, that they're really myths and legends. And the early church was just a creative community creating these myths and legends. Is that the case or are they intending to write factual history? All we have to do is turn to the beginning of Luke's gospel to see how much focus there is on reliable history. Luke chapter 1 verses 1 to 4. And as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, just as they were delivered to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things carefully from the beginning, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the truth concerning the things which you have been informed. Now read through that. There's an amazing piling up of terms of historical veracity. Look at what he says. He says he's investigated it carefully. He's interviewed the eyewitnesses. He wants you to know the truth 
concerning the things which you've been informed. Luke clearly intends to be writing accurate history, and it matters to Luke that these events actually took place. Here's our point. As an essentially historical religion, Christianity rises or falls on the historical reliability of the Gospels. Now, that's not actually true with every religion. Notice I say as an essentially historical religion. Most religions are based on a series of propositions, statements about the nature of God, let's say, or the nature of salvation. But Christianity moves beyond that. The the facts of history are essential for Christianity to be true or false, essential with respect to the claims Jesus made concerning himself. Who did Jesus actually claim to be? Was Jesus just a Jewish prophet or a Jewish teacher? Or did he claim to be the Messiah? Did he claim to be the Son of God? Did he claim in some sense to be God himself? Those claims, whether they're historical or not, are essential for the truth or the falsity of Christianity. So with respect to Jesus' claims concerning himself, Christianity rises or falls with respect to the significance of his death on the cross. The most undisputed fact about the historical Jesus is this. He was crucified. Everybody agrees on that. Everybody agrees he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, that he died, right? But what was the significance of that death? Was that just one more death of another Jewish prophet or revolutionary crucified by the Romans? Many of those took place during the first century. Or did that death have significance as a sacrifice of atonement, paying for the sins of the world? That makes a pretty big difference, doesn't it? How did Jesus view his death? Did Jesus expect to die? Did Jesus intend to die? These are big historical questions that we can examine the text to determine the answer. So the historical veracity with reference to his claims about himself, with reference to the significance of his death, what's the last, what's the third one? With reference to his what? What's the most important event in human history? The resurrection, with reference to the resurrection. If Jesus rose from the dead, that vindicates everything that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then he was just one more Jewish false prophet or teacher who claimed something big but didn't fulfill it. So Jesus' resurrection serves as vindication of who he was and who he is. It not only serves as vindication, it serves as the beginning of God's end time salvation. The confirmation, as Paul says, that we too will be raised. Paul is the one who brings this point out so strongly that if Christ has not been raised, then our faith is absolutely futile. If Christ has been raised, then everything he stood for and said is true. Here's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 14 to 19. If Christ, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. We are false witnesses, Paul says. We're fools if, in fact, We believe this and proclaim it if Christ has not been raised from the dead. But then he says, but Christ has indeed risen from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. At the beginning of this passage, he gives the evidence of those many witnesses who saw him alive. So Christianity rises or falls on the historical reliability of the Gospels. Pretty important topic. Okay, so the Gospels are history. That's the first category I want you to see. Here's the second one. The Gospels are narrative. The Gospels are narrative or story. Now, this has been a kind of a neglected aspect of the Gospels, as we'll see as we move a little bit further. But this is really, really important. And over the last 20 or 30 years, the focus on the Gospels as narrative or story has really been a helpful development in biblical scholarship. What's a, what's a narrative? A narrative is story, right? And what are some features of story? Just shout one out. What do, sto- what do all stories have? Plot, right? All stories have plot. That's good. See, that's my first one right there. All stories have plot. And how does a plot develop? What, what, do, most, what do plots have in them? Okay, th- those are characters. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, they, have, they have setting. That's another aspect. In fact, I'll just put them up. You guys have them. We're characters. You're so far ahead of it here. But in terms of a plot, as a plot goes along, plots have conflict, Right? If you don't have conflict, you don't really have a plot. Remember, when my kids were younger, we had lots of videos that we would show um, them to keep them occupied, you know. And there was this one video, and it was called The Little Bear. And I'm watching, watching this Little Bear video, and the Little Bear gets up in the morning, and he has breakfast. And then his mom sends him out to play, and he goes in the backyard and plays. And then he comes in, and he has lunch. And a little bit later, a friend comes over, and he and his friend play for a while. And I'm watching this video, and for some reason, it's driving me nuts, 
It's driving me crazy. And I, I can't figure out why it's driving me crazy. And suddenly it dawns on me, it mi it's missing something crucial to plot. What's it missing? Conflict. There's no conflict. Without conflict, there's no story. Now you look at the Gospels and you have conflicts in the stories. What's really interesting is to look at each Gospel and see how the conflicts develop and who the conflicts are with. At this point in my classes, I'll tell my students, I'll ask them a question. What's the first conflict in Mark's Gospel? And they'll think and think and then they'll open their Bibles and look. The first conflict in Mark's Gospel is when Jesus encounters a demon. Right? Jesus, well, no, it's, it's actually before that. It's when Jesus is tempted by Satan in the wilderness. The next conflict in Mark's gospel is when Jesus encounters a demon and casts out a demon. The next conflict is more demons. And so what is Mark trying to tell us about this gospel, about the conflicts in this gospel? This is a spiritual struggle, right? And then the very next series of conflicts are with the religious leaders. So what's Mark trying to tell us? Whose side are the religious leaders on? Are they on Jesus' side? Are they, they, they side of the kingdom of God? Or are they on the side of Satan? You can see. So Mark's developing this theme that we're going to see throughout his gospel. You turn to Matthew's gospel. What's the first conflict in Matthew's gospel? Well, who tries to kill Jesus in Matthew's gospel? Do you remember? Herod, King Herod. King Herod's title was King of the Jews. And so the false king of the Jews is trying to kill the true king of the Jews. And Jesus as the messianic king of the Jews is a key theme in Matthew's gospel. So what are we doing? We're following each gospel story, the progress of each gospel. How does each gospel resolve? What's the resolution of the plot or story in each gospel? Now, what's the resolution? You guys know the gospels, right? You've read the gospels, yeah. The resurrection, okay? Is the resurrection the last thing in each gospel? What's really interesting is to read the end of each gospel. What's the end of um, Matthew's gospel? Great commission. The resurrection ends, follows with the great commission. What's the, the last thing in Luke's gospel? The ascension, right? So there's different emphases. In Mark's gospel, there are no resurrection appearances, at least in the shorter version of the ending, which is probably the original ending. Instead, there's the announcement of the resurrection. So every gospel writer is developing their own story in a unique way. And we, we need to listen to that gospel writer's particular story, how that story is developed. Because the Holy Spirit gave us not one gospel, but, but actually four gospels. Okay, we, we talk about plot, we can talk about characters. What are the different kinds of characters we find in the gospels? Oh, antagonists, right? Who's the antagonist in the gospels? Okay, the Pharisees, the religious leaders are antagonists. Who else? We just mentioned them. Demons and Satans, right? Are, are, who's the protagonist? Now you get to say it, right? I tell my students in hermeneutics, all the answers are either context or Jesus, right? So, so, so the, ans the answer is Jesus is the, and God the Father, right? Okay, so then we look at the crowds. They're a character. Are the crowds antagonists or are they protagonists? They're both. They go back and forth. How about the disciples? Where do the disciples fit? And what's really interesting is to see how the disciples are portrayed in different Gospels. In some Gospels, they're more negatively portrayed than in others. In Mark's Gospel, the disciples are complete idiots for the most part. They fail, 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 fail. Mark doesn't even describe the restoration of the disciples at the end. He doesn't even bother doing that. Because the model for discipleship is not the disciples in Mark's Gospel. The model of discipleship is who? You get to say it again. Jesus, right? He's the, he's the one. He's the one that says, take up your cross and follow me, right? If you follow the disciples, you're going to end up rejecting Jesus, abandoning Jesus, leaving Jesus. So that, that emphasis on the disciples as, I call them, my gospel's textbook, I call them anti-disciples. Because that's what they are. They're the model not to follow. Jesus is the model to follow. But then you turn to Luke's gospel, and Luke's gospel very parallel in many ways, but there's a more positive presentation of the, of the disciples in Luke's gospel. He just tweaks it a little bit to show the positive side. Not a contradiction, but, but just a, a supplemental picture that shows a more positive side. Why do you think that would be? Why would Luke be important in, in rehabilitating the disciples? What's, Luke's gonna, what Luke, what's Luke going to write after the gospel of Luke? The book of Acts. Who's going to become the heroes of the book of Acts? right? The disciples. And so for Mark, they're anti-disciples. For Luke, they're apostles in training, right? They got a way to, ways to go, but they're going to get there. They're going to ultimately get there. 
So this is what we mean by the Gospels as narrative. Listening to the story. Every Gospel writer has a story to tell. It's progressing in a certain way. Characters are being presented in a certain way. There's settings. There's all kinds of powerful settings in the Gospels. In, in Matthew's Gospel, for example, mountain settings are really important. Mountain settings. Who went up to the mountain in the Old Testament? Moses, right? And Jesus presented as a new Moses in Matthew's gospel. So when he's going to give his classic sermon in Matthew, where does Jesus go? To the mountain, right? When he's going to be transfigured, where does he go? To the mountain, right? When he gives his great commission, where does he go? To the mountain. This is all Matthew. You see, Matthew's presenting Jesus as the new Moses. So listening to each of the individual stories is crucial. Because that's how the Holy Spirit gave it to us. Now that means we're against something that's very common among evangelical Christians. And that is harmonizing the Gospels into one story. You see, if you harmonize the Gospels, what do you risk doing? You risk missing each individual Gospel story, each individual perspective and portrayal. Okay? So the Gospels have plot, they have characters, they have setting. We could go into a lot more of those characters and those, those settings. But let's look at our third category with reference to the gospels the gospels are history the gospels are narrative and the gospels are theological they are theology what do we mean by theology we mean they are purpose driven long before rick warren had that term right they are purpose driven each gospel writer has a purpose in their story in their theology what they're trying to present these are not mere biographies now they do have biographical features but they're not mere biographies they are written with a theological purpose all the Gospels have purposes. You can read them by following, or you can determine them by following their plot, by following their emphases, by following their themes. John explicitly states that purpose. Here's John chapter 20, verse 30. Many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John writes, that you may believe. The purpose of his gospel is to call people to faith. That means both continuing faith as well as a call to initial faith. So each of the gospel writers writing with a purpose. What are the implications of that for the way we read them? As you read through a gospel, you need to be looking for the themes, the key themes. You need to be looking for the purpose. What is the gospel writer writing for? Here are questions to be asked. Three questions to be asked as you're reading through the gospel. The first question is, what portrait of Jesus is presented? There are four distinct and unique portraits of Jesus. Complementary, but not, not contradictory, but distinct emphases. We'll talk about the main emphases of each one in a minute. So what portrait of Jesus is being presented? Second, what themes bring out this portrait? Each of the gospel writers has particular themes. Luke's gospel, for example, has a strong emphasis on joy and rejoicing. has a strong emphasis on Jesus' prayer life has a strong emphasis on the Holy Spirit. These are themes that come up again and again as you're reading through the gospel. So look for those themes, underline them, note them, key words, key themes, because they supplement the portrait of Jesus in each gospel. So as you're discerning the portrait, as you're discerning the themes, here's a third th question to ask. What is the purpose of the gospel then? Based on the emphasis on Jesus' identity, Based on the various themes that bring this out, what is the gospel writer trying to do? And then, of course, by way of application, how does that purpose relate to us today? What can we get out of this gospel, understanding the author's purpose in writing? So three questions to ask. What portrait of Jesus, what themes bring this out, and what's the purpose of the gospel? Let me illustrate this, then, with Mark's gospel. Uh, Mark presents Jesus strongest emphasis of the four gospels on Jesus as the suffering servant or suffering son of God drawing strongly on that image in Isaiah chapter 53 of the suffering Messiah so very strong emphasis on that if that's the portrait then why is Mark likely writing probably writing to a suffering church now we know many of the churches in the first century were suffering but early tradition tells us that Mark is writing to Rome, that Mark is in Rome, that he's recording Peter's version of the gospel. And it's not so surprising in that context that he would be writing to a suffering church and would be talking about Jesus as the suffering Messiah. In AD 64, a fire broke out, a major fire that devastated much of the city of Rome. The emperor Nero 
after the fire, the fire burned out a lot of these slums and he used that area to expand his palace. And so there, a rumor started to go around that this was, this was actually Nero's plan for urban renewal. In fact, there were rumors running around that his, his soldiers were seen not fighting the fire but fanning the flames. That he actually helped to burn Rome so that he could expand his, his palace. And so um, all, all of this blame was coming to, to Nero. So Nero decided he was going to deflect the blame by blaming the Christians for the fire. We get one of the major, first major persecutions of the Christians... Uh, the, the Jewish, uh, the, the Roman writer, the Roman historian Tacitus writes about the fire in Rome. Do you like my little clip art there? That's, that's for free right there. It took me a while to figure that one out. Yeah. So he writes about this. He says that Nero tried to deflect the blame, but when he couldn't, he turned on the Christians. Here's what he says. He says, no human effort, no princely largesse, in other words, no bribes, nor offerings to the gods could make that infamous rumor disappear that Nero had somehow ordered the fire. Therefore, in order to abolish that rumor, Nero falsely accused and ex executed with the most exquisite punishments those people called Christians. First, those, who were, those were seized who admitted their faith. Then, using the information they provided, a vast multitude were convicted and perishing. They were additionally made into sports. They were killed by dogs by having the hides of beasts attached to them, or they were nailed to crosses or set aflame. When the daylight passed away, they were used as nighttime lamps. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering for their faith in Rome. Many scholars think that Mark was written in the context of this persecution. Written to encourage the church to, say, to stay faithful through persecution just as Jesus had. Now listening to Mark's gospel, reading Mark's gospel, following his plot and story, we can see this purpose being developed. So what I do, I want to just illustrate this by looking at Mark's overall structure. We don't have time to go through this in detail, but let me just summarize Mark's outline and show you how Mark brings out this particular theme. Uh, Mark's gospel, one of the main purposes is clearly Christological, focusing on who Jesus is. And his portrait really describes Jesus as the suffering Messiah, the suffering servant of God. But that's not how the gospel starts. In fact, Mark's gospel can be divided almost right down the middle. In the first half of Mark's gospel, the key theme is authority. Jesus comes on the scene and he's this incredibly powerful and mighty individual. He's clearly the, the, the mighty and powerful son of God. The key word is authority. Jesus casts out demons. He heals the sick. He calls disciples. He proclaims the kingdom. He demonstrates great wisdom in these debates against the religious leaders. Over and over again, you're looking at this guy and it's just amazing. Uh, he calms the sea. The, the, the disciples are just amazed. They, at one point they stop and they go, who is this guy? Right? We don't know. He, he doesn't seem to be from around here. Who is this guy? And so Jesus' mighty power as the Son of God is the key theme of the first half of the gospel. Then we get to a key center point and the theme changes or moves forward to the suffering role of the servant of the Lord. So first Mark wants to demonstrate and prove that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. Right? Anyone looking at Christianity from, from afterwards would say, oh, that guy got crucified. He can't possibly be the Messiah. So Mark is demonstrating through the first half of the gospel that Jesus is the mighty Messiah. But then the Messiah's role is to suffer and die. And the key turning point comes right in the middle. It's the key axis on which the whole gospel turns. turns. Remember, Jesus is headed north to Caesarea Philippi. He takes his disciples on a spiritual retreat. And on the way, what does he do? He asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? Right? And they say, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Some say one of the prophets. And Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Who speaks up? Peter. Peter says, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. And at that point, Jesus begins to predict he's going to suffer and die. See, what's remarkable is through the first, whole first half of the gospel, Mark has been demonstrating the authority of Jesus. He is the Messiah. Peter gets it. He says, you are the Messiah. He gets it because he's seen all these mighty works. And then immediately Jesus says, the Messiah is going to suffer and die. Remember what Peter says? No way. He starts to rebuke him. And Jesus rebukes him right back and says, get behind me, Satan. Right? It's diabolical, it's satanic to reject the suffering role of the Messiah. So the, the Peter's confession and Jesus' first passion prediction is the middle point of the gospel. The middle point on which the whole gospel turns. You can see where Mark is going with this. Many were saying Jesus can't be the Messiah. He suffered and died, crucifixion. So he demonstrates he's the Messiah and then he demonstrates that all along 
It was part of God's purpose and plan that the Messiah would suffer. So the whole point in showing this is to show Mark's got a particular story to tell. He's got a particular presentation of Jesus to give. Here's our point. Each gospel writer relates certain stories and emphasizes particular themes to bring out their particular purpose, to achieve their particular goal. So how should we read each of the four gospels? As individual gospels, as individual stories, rather than bringing them together into a single story. So here's where we are. The Gospels are historical narrative motivated by theological concerns. Meant to convey accurate historical information. To explain and interpret these salvation bringing events. And to proclaim the good news of Jesus the Messiah. They're historical, focusing on key historical events. The authenticity of these historical events. But the significance of those events is just as important. Um, Meant to proclaim the good news of of salvation. I said I'd give you the key themes from my perspective. There's, you can take different perspectives. Here are the key emphases of each of the four Gospels. Matthew presents Jesus as the Messianic King of the Jews. Strong emphasis on the Jewishness of the Messiah. Strong emphasis on the pr- prophetic fulfillment. Twelve times Mar- Matthew says this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. So that Matthew is the strongest, the most Jewish of the Gospels written to encourage Jewish Christians, particularly who were being attacked by their unbelieving Jewish neighbors, the Messianic King of the Jews. Mark stresses Jesus as the suffering servant of the Lord, as we've just said, emphasis on Jesus' suffering role. All the Gospels focus on Jesus' suffering role, but Mark's is a particularly strong theme. Luke presents Jesus as the Savior for lost people everywhere. Luke's is the most inclusive, most comprehensive of the four Gospels. Jesus demonstrates love for outsiders, especially, not just tax collectors and sinners, but Samaritans, but those who are of lower social status, women and children and so forth. So strong emphasis on the inclusivity of the Gospel. Now again, you think think about that. Luke's emphasis on the inclusivity of the Gospel. What's Luke going to write next? The book of Acts, where the Gospel is going to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. So this theme of God, the Gospel for the outcasts, the outsiders, is so important for Luke. John has the highest Christology, the one that most emphasizes Jesus as truly divine, the divine Son of God who reveals, who reveals the Father. Let me give you four quick principles for reading and teaching the Gospels. Here's the one we've just been talking about. Avoid harmonization. Respect each gospel's narrative and theological unity. Now this is ironic a little bit because in many ways it's those who have the highest respect for scripture that have a tendency to harmonize the gospels. We evangelicals, we conservatives, will often harmonize the gospels. I started teaching at a small Christian college and the class I inherited was called Life of Christ. And basically the class was brought together all the four Gospels into one story, a chronological life of Christ. Now that's fine, but that's, what are we doing? We're taking four masterpieces, theological masterpieces, given to us by the Holy Spirit, and we're cutting and pasting them into a new story, a man-made story that isn't what the Holy Spirit gave us. We as evangelicals should have the most respect for what the Holy Spirit gave us. We should listen to each Gospel's story, each Gospel's narrative. So I just changed the title of that class. Instead of Life of Christ, I called it Gospel Perspectives on the Life of Christ. Four unique perspectives on the life of Christ. So let me encourage you as you go through the Gospels to respect each Gospel story rather than bringing in events from the other Gospels. Here's a second principle. Read vertically. And this is really saying the same thing. Read vertically means follow the story. Reading down the page, in other words. From introduction to conflict to to climax, to ultimately resolution. Follow the plot, examine the characters, look at the settings, determine these various things. This is understanding the Gospels as story. We call that reading vertically. Here's our third principle of reading the Gospels. Read read horizontally. I just said don't read harmonistically. Read horizontally. Now it's good to compare the Gospels. We've got especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are very similar. It's it's not bad to compare them, but by comparing them, we can see each gospel's unique perspective. So by looking at Matthew, comparing it with Mark, we can see what Matthew emphasizes, what his key themes are, (coughs) what his key purpose in writing is, and so forth. So reading horizontally means comparing the gospels to one another. 
by not reading harmonistically, it doesn't mean we're not looking at the other Gospels. It means we're not introducing stories from the Gospels into the main Gospel narrative. And finally, um, number four, read through first century eyes. Respect the Gospels' historical context. Uh, too often we introduce our understanding, our ideas. We've been saying this all, all along today. Listen to the context. Immerse yourself in the context and the culture, the perspective in which each gospel was written. We'll better understand Jesus' teaching if we understand the world in which it arose. 